that old statue over there? That's Kitchener Leslie. Oh yes, I knew him. I worked with him for a time, but that was later. Well, it's not often spoken of, but when he first came round these parts, Kitchener made his living as a knight of the post, robbing travelers on the road, a petty criminal and nothing more. They say he built his hideout very close to here. To start, he set six triangle foundations in this funny way. With a tool cupboard right here. Then he walled it all in, except for the entrance, where he set his front door, with another one just behind it. Window frames were set into the alcoves, where he could place furnaces to smelt the gold and silver bits and bobs he stole, to later sell to the jewelers, of course. Safer, can't be traced, the clever bastard. Now, knowing that wild animals and wilder men roamed the frontier, he chose to set his entrance above ground level. And so he closed the first door with walls, leaving a chute to jump to the second. First, this chute was closed with a shelf and a door. Then he closed the second floor with walls as well, but leaving the last one open. After that came three doors and a window frame, where he could set an embrasure or a bulletproof window when he went to sleep. Humble his little hideout was, good enough to start with, but the more people he robbed, the richer he grew, and so he set to fortifying his hideout, for there is no honor amongst thieves. First, in the innermost core of his base, he armored his TC compartment. All doors in the base were replaced with more secure garage doors. In the core, every ceiling was armored, and every floor, wall and window frame was upgraded to metal. Iron vaults stolen from merchants' wagons were placed in the core, one against this wall here, and four more in the alcoves, placed like so. A ladder hatch replaced the furnace, and a stone window frame was built to further fortify the core entrance. On the second floor, the wall to the right of the chute was armored and all the other walls and ceilings were fortified with sheet metal. May as well tell you now that he would later put his best workbench up here as well, against this right wall here. And for the last touch he fortified his TC, placing two metal window frames right in front of it, hard side facing towards him, and placing iron vaults between them, being very careful to place them exactly in this way as a retired old sultan once showed him that in this configuration they would conceal the TC while leaving it accessible, including even the locking mechanism, but more importantly in this configuration an outwards facing horizontal embrasure will divert damage away from the glass window, thus requiring 9 rockets in total to reach the cupboard. And for many this would have sufficed. But with his greed now satisfied, his vanity grew. A little hideout like this would no longer do for one such as he, for now he wished to make his name known in this wild new land. Kitchener went about his task as a man possessed. Indeed, always a fighting man, trained in war, he was finding a new love and indeed a great unexpected talent for the builder's art. Those sides of his base not already honeycombed, he honeycombed in metal. He then went a step further and added the whole layer of stone honeycomb around the core. Upon accomplishing this, he clambered up and closed his second floor entrance with a metal wall and a stone triangle shelf. Then, climbing up, he finished the metal chute with another useful stone shelf.
From up here he could honeycomb the second floor of his hideout as well. To start on the third floor, first of all this floor triangle was upgraded and a metal compartment was built and closed with a stone window frame. The floor was then closed in with walls and an entrance was set atop this honeycomb triangle utilizing three stone frames and a window frame behind them. After roofing the third floor, Kitchener installed two garage doors and a ladder hatch in those frames. Also employing a new fangled autogun he bribed an army supply officer for to protect the entrance. Up on the roof, two half-height walls were built around the ladder hatch with defensive stone roof ramps slanting outwards from the inner circle of triangles. To finish his mighty fort he built an entrance ramp. This is a bit tricky so let's look carefully. Facing the entrance of his fort he went to the second wall to the left here building out three twig triangle foundations leftwards, three squares towards himself and two squares to the right. To the last square he attached a raised metal triangle foundation pointing towards the base. Upon this foundation he set two slanted metal roofs. To make jumping up easier a temporary wooden square would go behind the raised triangle. With that done, climbing back up to the third floor, a wooden triangle was placed in the metal compartment and protected with reinforced glass. Now why all these complications just to build an entrance? So here's the deal, when you build a TC in your base, the TC extends an exclusion zone in which no other TCs can be built. If the base is extended, this zone is extended as well. If you have two structures with TCs, each has its exclusion zone, and those don't fully overlap. The problem is that if raiders come and destroy the TC in one, they can build their own TC, taking over and griefing the base. If however two bases are built as before and then extended, the exclusion zones overlap fully and raiders cannot build a new TC in one before they take the other as well. Well that's great, but the problem is you can't build a new TC there either. But by destroying that wooden shelf we built, the extension could be detached, diminishing the zone and allowing a new TC to be built before reattaching the extension with a new wooden shelf. This will become very useful very soon. Kitchener was fast becoming a household name in the frontier. And over the next few months, there came those who wanted to capture him, as well as some who wanted to join with him. We wish to join forces with you, as men have no eyes on their backs, and even one such as us can fall to ambush. This he thought was rubbish, but the idea of becoming a leader of men appealed to him very much indeed. To expand the camp, Kitchener went out and attached a triangle foundation to the wooden square followed by three squares to the left. From the last square he built a metal triangle foundation with a circle of metal triangles to the right of it. This was then expanded to a star shape. Before completing this shape, however, the two closest square foundations were destroyed and replaced with one raised metal foundation pointing towards the new base. The footprint was then completed with stone, identical to that of the first tower. The TC would go here on this Ah, here we see the effect of the disconnectable extensions. Once the wooden shelf was picked out, the TC could be placed, here on this triangle exactly, the furthest one on the left within the inner circle of the footprint. From here he went on to create a tower nearly identical to the first. The only important structural difference was a slight alteration in where the metal compartment for the wooden shelf was placed, forced by the position of the two metal roof ramps, with the entrance positioned to the left of the entrance ramp.
To complete the day's work, the wooden shelf was rebuilt in the first tower. A truly mighty fortress they now had, and the name of Kitchener Leslie would come to inspire fear and terror. Absolutely fearless they were, for none had the skill, speed, or the wits to match them. And as Kitchener's fortunes swelled, so did his pride and infamy. And that may have been the end of it, had not God Almighty, seeing the wickedness of this beloved wayward son, chosen to intervene. A terrible drought struck the land. Wheat withered and livestock lay starving. Food was running so scarce that tales were heard of bandits snatching bread from the mouths of children. These were very dangerous times. And so, starving and embattled, the people flocked to the only pillar of strength they could think of, the frontier fortress of one Kitchener Leslie. Upon seeing this wretched lot, moved by the sight of slim, unfed children calling to him for protection, Kitchener felt his heart stir and knew what he must do. And so, at first light, he set the men to build a barn, where those dispossessed could safely store what little grain and livestock they brought with them. First, the two wooden triangle shelves in the main towers were removed so as to allow a new tool cupboard to be placed in close proximity. Then, from the center of the camp, a twig triangle foundation was built, followed by three twig squares. Then came a stone triangle, a stone square to the right, followed by a triangle pointing left, and two more squares attached to that last triangle. The footprint was then rounded out with triangles, with three more triangles pointing out from the three square foundations, like so. The leading twig square was then removed and replaced with a raised metal triangle, followed by a roof slanted towards the new structure. The first thing to be built in the new barn was an armored compartment for the TC, built upon the furthest triangle to the right with the opening oriented towards the center of the compound. To fortify the tool cupboard while leaving it accessible, just like in the two main towers, another metal triangle compartment was established, and sturdy metal vaults were placed in it, exactly like before. And before continuing on to the main structure, the TC compartment was honeycombed, with a triangle metal honeycomb behind it, as well as one directly above. With the TC thus fortified, the rest of the foundations were then closed in with walls. The wall facing the entrance ramp could not be honeycombed, and was therefore upgraded with stone honeycomb built everywhere else, like so. The triangle compartment with the sheet metal wall would house a large battery, and a garage door was built to further separate the two compartments from the main structure of the base. Followed by a metal ceiling behind the garage door and stone ceilings all around but for the central triangle where a ladder hatch was placed. Up top, after properly flooring the base, a compartment was built for the now famous wooden triangle shelf, right against the metal roof ramp, with its ceiling and outside wall made of sheet metal. In this case, the inside wall, on the right, could remain stone. Then followed the regular two garage door entrance with the autogun, this time without a ladder hatch though, and the second floor was closed in with walls like so. Facing the shelf compartment, a locker was placed for rapid deployment, kept locked and safe behind a metal embrasure, and a water reservoir was placed right behind the wooden shelf compartment. To finish it off, two levels of stone frames went up on the roof, and a windmill was placed on top. This would come to assist them greatly in the growing of new crops. And lastly, the wooden shelves were rebuilt in both towers, re-extending the protection range of the TCs. With the barn made good and proper and the windmill powering it all, 
they could produce enough to easily feed all the residents, with even extras that could be sold to various merchants. But all this industry did not go unnoticed. The attacks came fast and hard. Many of the defenders were slain, though they took many of the bandit traders with them. This time the bandits were driven off, but this state of affairs could not continue. The new town had to be made defensible, and Kitchener knew exactly what needed doing. First, the wooden squares attached to the two main towers were removed, replaced by high stone triangle foundations. To make sure the metal triangles could be easily replaced if destroyed, Kitchener aligned his compound entrances with them. At the second tower, triangles were built off of the raised metal triangle foundation and upgraded to stone. Then followed four more triangles heading outwards until two squares could be built, like this. The last triangle and the two squares were upgraded to stone, with the rest removed. Here Kitchener built a basic compound entrance, like so. An autogun would later be placed here to defend the inner area of the compound. From the gatehouse door, three more stone squares were built, then a triangle, followed by a square to the right and a metal triangle to finish. This metal triangle was formed into a metal compartment for the tool cupboard and the square room was closed in stone walls and another window frame, followed by a doorway to make entering and leaving faster and safer. Stone arches were mounted on the stony path and the middle square was fortified with metal. The same exact process was then copied at the other side of the compound, starting from the raised triangle foundation attached to the first tower. A third such entrance was then built, on its own, this time not attached to anything, whereupon a neat little walled compound rose around the nascent village. But this wasn't enough. Being one himself, Kitchener knew for certain that bandits will wait to ambush any merchant who tried venturing out to sell their produce. An alternative to foot travel had to be found. And valuable as the flying machine was, he built for it a great tower at the center of the compound, thereupon to land. From the barn's ramp, he built two raised stone foundations surrounded by raised triangles, on which he mounted three levels of stone frames in this configuration. A two-square bay was built, surrounded by windows, with a turret inside it. The flying machines were pretty expensive in those days. Barricades were placed on the roof to prevent anyone from climbing there. After closing the bay with a garage door, a circular landing pad followed. The landing pad would be protected by half-high stone walls like so. ladders were attached to the sides of the landing pad, so that Kitchener and his deputies could jump to and from it at any time from the roofs of their tower fortresses. Lastly, a flame trap at the opening would crispen any unauthorized climber of the ladder, along with the ladder itself. And that was that. Safe and secure from raiders, able to grow produce and deliver it to traders unimpeded, 
Trinity Town flourished. Kitchener stayed here for a while, cared for the people he saved as a father cares for his children, he did. But in the end, he left. Where did he go? Well, these are settled lands now, and the frontier moves ever westwards. Wild new lands to explore, full of adventure and unclaimed treasure. Yes, I think I know where he went. Men like that cannot resist the call of the wild. I see the gleam in your eyes. Reminds me of him, you know? <laughs>